I have an interview coming up in a minute with Lance Mahia, the creator of the fantastic movie Third Eye Spies, a true story of CIA psychic spying. And I could leave it at that. That would be a good level one introduction, but I'm not into level one. As you know, I'm into level three. Third Eye Spy, Stargate program, CIA, 1970s, spying on the Russians using psychics before they spy on us. The whole psychic spying program is really important because it shatters the mind equals brain crazy paradigm that we live in. These guys were way past that. They knew that consciousness extends beyond our brain because they were doing it every day in practice. But at the same time, they were engaged in some pretty dark MK Ultra mind control kind of stuff. Now, on one hand, that isn't even controversial. In the movie, you'll hear them talk about their boss, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, the U.S. version of Joseph Mengele, as some people call him. Joseph Mengele, you know, infamous Nazi doctors. Well, in the movie, they kind of play that off as, oh, you know, we didn't really agree with what Sidney was doing. Well, you might not have agreed with him, but Sidney was the damn boss of the thing, and he was the boss of this operation, too, because all this stuff, including the psychic spying program, fell under the this umbrella of mind control, and that fell under this range of programs, over 150 programs, called MK Ultra. So how about that for more than level one? And finally, and you'll hear this in the interview, although we don't cover it completely, you got the whole UFO thing. These psychic spies, Joseph McMonagall, Ingo Swan, others, they're remote viewing Mars. They're remote viewing the dark side of the moon. And they're saying, hey, there's people there. There's bases there. There's technology there. There's aliens there. And anyone around this program will tell you, if Ingo Swan said it, it's true. He didn't lie. He didn't make stuff up. So that kind of puts us in a tough level three position. What are we supposed to do? Believe Jimmy Carter when he says that these remote viewers found a downed plane that no one else could find in Africa? On the other hand, we're supposed to not believe and totally discredit their other findings? Well, now you get a sense of why it's so hard, but at the same time necessary to get past the level one Here's a great new movie, which it is. Here's the best movie that's ever been made about Stargate, which it is. Here's a great filmmaker who's done a great job, Lance Munguia, which he is. But you might also understand why I don't agree with him on a lot of stuff and why there's this underlying tension throughout this interview. Here are some clips from the show. And I might jump in after some of these clips, too, because I can't resist adding some more level three stuff. The storyline that the movie follows is that Russell Targ, who is, of course, one of the original principal investigators in this Stargate remote viewing program, and he's going to reconnect with all these people that have been a part of this amazing program. He literally showed up at my door with a big box full of documents that were marked classified and then that had been released. And he starts laying out all of these documents on a table. And I started to actually question it because it was so incredible um, that I, I remember going to bed after, after meeting him the first night and thinking, is this guy like for real? I mean, this, this is something that is so incredible that I'm only going to really be able to do something like this if I can get everybody, because it was one of those things where if it's just one person saying it, it just, it sounds too outlandish. The conspiratorial guy that I am, one of the first questions I had from the beginning is, why do you think they released all these documents? I have a hard time believing it's just for the vanity or the, the interest of this sweet old man, Professor Russell Targ, who says, <laughs> Oh, I have all kinds of thoughts on that. Um, you know, we think of government as a monolithic thing. The government is coming after this, or the government is hiding this. Uh, government intentionally is very dysfunctional. So this is actually a great point. Intentionally dysfunctional. I love it. And I thought he was going someplace with it. But if you listen to the interview, he really doesn't go anyplace with it. He goes back to saying, well, you know, these things kind of happen in one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. Lance, if it's intentionally dysfunctional, then it's not really dysfunctional. There's an intention behind it. Who's driving the agenda behind that intention? 
The presidents and elected officials are always the last to know. I would say the CIA director often falls in that category too, because I would. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, possibly. You know, I, I would say the CIA director probably knows more than the president does. Um, but but uh, Russell and Hal, the two scientists that started this this program in the 70s, were, were both already um, vetted people working within established intelligence circles. Let me just clarify. You're saying as opposed to, as we do understand it now, some programs that are just black. And yeah, they're... these were not black programs. These were, these were secret programs, but they had oversight. And, and uh, if you think about something like remote viewing, how easy is it to do remote viewing? Basically, you close your eyes, you imagine where your uh, target is, is, is hiding, and then you write down what comes to your mind, the first unexpected images that you get, and that's it. You know, so, so it, it doesn't take billions of dollars. It doesn't take fighter jets. Um, but the government is uniquely placed to be able to find out if you're right or wrong. So, so you can infiltrate the regular uh, intelligence agencies by giving them information and, and not telling them where it comes from. Wow, this is such a cool point, and it's something I never thought of before. As Lance points out, this is kind of the ultimate tool on so many levels. First, it has this huge yield. You have to put almost no money into it, and you get this huge intelligence payoff on the other end. But the other thing, as Lance points out, it has this power, the kind of power that only secrets can bring, because you have information that only you can vet. So the, the, these guys are playing this disinformation, misinformation, and spread of information at a 3D chess level that we don't totally even get. Absolutely. So take what you're saying and extend it to that. Who knows, you know, what's going on? So then the, the, what do you think those guys are doing with the UFO disclosure thing? Well, that's, that's, that's right where I was going to go. Uh, you, you know, the, the, uh, my take on both them with remote viewing and them with the UFO thing. And I am talking specifically about the people that I interviewed that were um, still sort of involved in these kinds of projects, even by their own admission, um, is that these are people who are in the, in, on the inside, but they're not really on the inside. Let me just throw this out because I, I always right. die to get someone's opinion on this who's truly thought about it and studied it as you mm -hmm. are. It seems to me that there's this straight up political thing that's going on that uh, too few people talk about. There's a left, right, Republican, Democrat, if you will, kind of flavor to some of this. So this, the UFO disclosure thing is clearly coming from the left. And I don't say that to prejudice it in any way. It just clearly, clearly is. It's Podesta and Clinton were originally the ones that wanted to bring it out and they weren't elected. So... Tom DeLong, who was hooked into that, went ahead and brought it out anyway. And Peter Lavenda, who was part <laughs> of that whole thing, which is lifetime spook. I'm just saying, in broad strokes, that seems to be one of the, the, the overlays on this. And I, I'd love to hear anything you think about that. Well, number one, Trump will be the last person they ever tell. <laughs> He'll be the last one on the boat, I think. But oh, but he has his own. He has his own people who are telling him. I mean, well, they're they're he's starting Space Force, and we don't know why, and all this kind of stuff. Yes, but but uh, you you got to look at. I, I think I don't know that it's left versus right as much as it is sort of logic versus superstition. So I said there was some tension in this interview, and at this point you can feel it. Whenever I stumble into these political discussions, I'm always blindsided because to me it's clear that politics is just nonsense. It's such a low-level game and that the real players are at a much higher level than this. And that'll do it for interruptions and commentary before the interview. You know, I've never done this before if you've listened to this show, so I don't know if people are going to like this or not like this. But before you tell me, let me give you a chance to listen to my complete interview with Lance Munguia. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and at this point, we're all familiar with remote viewing and the history of psychic spying that began in the 1970s with the Stargate program at Stanford Research Institute. But today's guest, award-winning filmmaker Lance Munguia, has a film out, Third Eye Spies, that is 
really a, a deeper look into this history and its implications, not just for proving that we're more than biological robots in a meaningless universe, but also a deep dive into the politics of secrecy, the ongoing tension between liberty and security, and ultimately about our place within this thing we call consciousness. Lance, this is going to be a super exciting interview for me. Thank you so much for joining me on Skeptico. Oh, hey, thank you so much for having me. This is like a lot of fun, and I, I really appreciate your, your having me on. Well, great. You know, we were just chatting a minute ago. The more I get to know your project, uh, Third Eye Spies, which is a great movie. And we should mention, by the way, you know, if people haven't seen the movie, it's now even available on Amazon Prime where you can just go watch it for free, which is, wow, that's a great deal. Why did you decide to put it out on Amazon Prime just to kind of spread it out to so more people could get to it or? Well, um, yes, um, you know, Amazon Prime, you know, is, is uh, if you have an Amazon Prime membership, the film is free there. And, um, you know, it's also available on iTunes. It's available on um, Vimeo, you know, pretty much anywhere that you can get the digital downloads. But we really wanted to make uh, the film available for uh, free if, if possible, you know, like through something like Amazon Prime or, or um, Netflix. And, and uh, we ultimately decided on Amazon Prime because, uh, you know, it just seems like that really was where the audience was at. And, and actually, we've been doing, you know, um, well there. It seems like a lot of people are finding the film there and um, are able to see it. And for me, that was the most important thing more than anything else was just simply being able to, you know, have the film out there and have it be seen by people, you know, cause it's a, a subject that a lot of people don't know about. And, um, you know, it's, it represents Russell Targ's life work. And so it was very important for me just that, that it be out there, uh, in such a way that, that, uh, um, it's easily findable and, um, Amazon prime really gave us that opportunity and we're really grateful for that. For anyone who isn't familiar with the movie third eye spies, let me go ahead and play a trailer from the movie. If you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. We found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? It was a research facility. That was all that we were going to tell them. Russians have been spending millions of dollars investigating so-called ESP. Psychic spies. Almost a psychic arms race here. Is there any real application to this? I think remote viewing has been demonstrated over the 20 years of work that's been sponsored by the government. Producing crucial and vital intelligence to the NSA, CIA, DEA, and the Secret Service. I began to feel frightened. The KGB did it, man. What's really going on here? State-sponsored assassination attempt. The CIA was lying. They wanted to kill the program. A storm brewing. This is real. I say no more secrets. Let this information out. Well, a great trailer. Yeah, great. It's actually really a, a very cool trailer. <laughs> it is a cool trailer. <laughs> it's a cool movie. People who haven't seen the movie, this is uh, cinematography. This is a uh, theater quality documentary. And I think a lot of people have praised you for it. And, and you deserve that, that praise. So anything else you want to tell us about the movie making process or Third Eye Spies that isn't covered there in the trailer? Um, well, the, the movie itself took, um, uh, you know, quite a long time to make, mainly because I was doing it, uh, you know, as, as a labor of love. I mean, I, I was working on this kind of sporadically as I was also trying to, uh, you know, do other things. And, um, you know, it, it uh, really represents the first time that a lot of the people that are in the film have actually been on camera. Uh, one of the reasons that the film took so long was because I had to personally reach out to a lot of people, uh, you know, who were very kind of skittish, you know, to be on camera. And it, that process actually took a number of months uh, for me to um, reach out to people like Kit Green, like uh, Ken Kress, 
uh, who was the CIA uh, program manager for the uh, remote viewing program, the first one. Uh, so in let, the... let me jump in there because we're going to throw around a lot of names that some mm -hmm. people will not be familiar with or will be kind of vaguely familiar with. Mm -hmm. But the storyline that the movie follows is that Russell Targ, who is, of course, one of the original principal investigators in this Stargate remote viewing program, along with Hal Putoff, is kind of on this you know, final mission, you know, he's an older guy, and he's going to reconnect through you, you're with him every step of the way with all these people that have been a part of this amazing program. And he gets these documents released. And then the thread of the story is, okay, guys, we can now tell the story that we wanted to tell for so long and let's go do it and you go sit down with these people all over the world and they fill in the blanks of this story that we kind of have known about the story of psychic spying but it's just gets a lot deeper than that yeah i i actually uh, knew something about this whole program even since i was a child like i remember uh, before this was even declassified uh reading an episode of my grandmother's uh reader's digest and it was talking about this, like, uh, um, you know, top secret army remote viewing program. There'd been leaks about, I think this was in the 80s. And, and, um, and I kept this, like, dog-eared copy of Reader's Digest for decades. Like, you know, into college, I had this because I always thought, you know, wow, this would make a really interesting film someday. And, uh, you know, but I didn't know a whole lot about it. But I had also researched some of um, Hal Putoff's work and some of um, Russell's daughter's work sort of through... Uh, healing and and through uh, you know sort of the way consciousness kind of works. So I was familiar with them uh, when I got a call from a mutual friend of Russell Targ's uh, to say that uh, Russell Targ was interested in in speaking with me because he had seen uh, another film that I had done. He saw a film called Six String Samurai, which you can find also on Amazon Prime and on uh, you know the internet. And um, and he just thought it was a really visually interesting film, and he had a a, a script that he wanted to turn into a movie, which was a narrative film, which had nothing to do with, with uh, remote viewing. It was about ESP, but it was done in a kind of a narrative con uh, way. And I read his script and, and, uh, and then we spoke on the phone about it. And um, I said, look, I said, you know, the real story here, I think, is this remote viewing stuff that you did for the government. I mean, this is a fantastic story. Can we even talk about it? And he said, you know, he said, my friend Ingo died last year. Uh, you know, he was one of my subjects. And, and uh, I'm afraid that all of these people are going to pass away and we're not going to get ever get their stories on camera so yeah i would love to do that and so he literally flew out to la and we spent a long weekend together um just talking about the possibilities and frankly he literally showed up at my door with a big box full of documents that were marked you know classified you know and then and then that had been you know released you know and um and he starts laying out all of these documents on a table and i literally uh even though i knew something about this i did not at all know the extent to what had happened uh, with this program that had gone back over 20 years, uh, you know, and, and what they had done. And I started to actually question it because it was so incredible um, that I, I remember going to bed after, after meeting him the first night and thinking, is this guy like for real? I mean, this, this is something that is so incredible that I'm only going to really be able to do something like this if I can get everybody that is still alive that, that I can find, um, you know, enough credible witnesses, uh, you know, to really discuss this because it was one of those things where if it's just one person saying it, it just, it sounds too outlandish and you need to hear it from a bunch of different people. And so that was really my condition going into the film. And, and we actually talked also at the beginning, and this is something I don't think I've talked about before, uh, uh about the possibility that we may be still stumbling into, ongoing classified work and uh, you know we didn't know like what CIA and what some of these other agencies were were still doing or what they might not want us to talk about so there was actually like a real conversation about like what do we really want to do this and and ultimately we decided that enough of the work had been already declassified and um and that we were going to be talking about the history we wouldn't be going into any kind of speculation because i think where this sort of falls apart is when you go into speculation and you start talking about what well i know but i can't tell you what my sources are or or whatever and then and then it becomes sort of second hand and and we wanted this to actually be a historical document not a speculative document you know because uh everything in it is is very well documented 
you know, there's so many story threads in the movie. And in turn, there's so many story threads in the part that you just laid on us right there. Because like one little bit that you mentioned about your tattered copy of Reader's Digest is one of the things your movie reminded me is that this was outed like 20 years ago. So you have film clips of Ted Koppel, who, for folks who are a little bit younger and don't remember, but he was it, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of serious nighttime news, you know, he was the guy. And he's out saying, well, hey, there's, there's a psychic spying thing going on. We're in a race with the Russians. They're doing it. We're doing it. Basically lays the whole thing out. But part of the storyline is that that changes. And then we move away from that. And we move into this kind of skeptical denying, did it really happen kind of thing. We don't really ever get to understanding what the purpose of that, why the narrative changed from kind of this openness, which there was about it, to this denial of it. Yeah. So we can kind of go down that. And then at the same time, I want to throw this out, throw this on the table too, because you, you touched on the ongoing nature of these programs and mm -hmm. you have just a little bit of a tease at the very <laughs> end with, I think it was Kid Green, but it might've won one of the other, you know, super duper insiders mm -hmm. in an elevator saying, Oh yeah, these programs are still ongoing. I know it from a, my most trusted, reliable source, mm -hmm. which of course, all of us who've really studied this have said, duh, of course, if you can gather any information you want, the most secreted information in the world from your enemies, of course, you're going to continue to do it. You're not going to stop doing it just because some senator has some religious objections or something <laughs> like that. You know, you know that's, that's actually... When I first, again, started this, looking at this from sort of filmmaker's perspective, from a storytelling perspective, um, I would ask people, and, and especially Russell being, you know, a, a producer on the project, Russell Targ, who was the founding, uh, co-founding um, scientist who started all of this, who's the villain? You know, like, who's, who's the, the bad guy in this? I mean, you know, what is, and, and he didn't even think about it. He just said it's, it's, it's the, uh, the, the religious dogma you know, the, the, uh, the scientific dogma to a certain extent, but mainly religious dogma. And, and uh, I didn't believe him, you know, frankly, I, I thought, you know, that's this way too outlandish. If you have a useful tool, you're not going to tell me that some guy that thinks it's, you know, the devil's work or something is going to keep you from doing it. And, and what I learned, you know, through uh, years of going out and interviewing, you know, the, these people that did this um, was, yeah, I mean, I mean that that pretty much was one of the biggest obstacles that they had was just not only a scientific skepticism, but a completely illogical skepticism that wouldn't even look at the data, that wouldn't even uh, entertain the idea that this could even um, be because this was something that was, um, uh, you know, supernatural and 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 spooky and and uh, uh, scary to them. Well, and. Yeah. Exactly what you said. It's not just spooky and scary. It is the devil's work, you know, mm -hmm. and you have a clip in the film with Joe McGonigal yes. has been on the show and I think is terrific in a number of ways. Although I also had an interview with Ed May and who ran the program after Russell Targ and Hal Putoff left. And he's an interesting character because he kind of, says he's friends with Joe, but then on the other hand, contradicts what Joe's saying, because Joe sees these deeper spiritual connections with like near-death experience and consciousness in general. But I digress, because one of the points that again stuck out to me in Third Eye Spies is this point where, where Joe really becomes kind of passionate talking to Russ. He goes, Russell, we survived five presidential <laughs> administrations. Mm -hmm. And you get the sense of I, we had to put up with all this craziness, political craziness, that was sometimes driven by purely this fanatical Christian kind of craziness about, you know, how we should understand this stuff from this very narrow religious perspective that uh, I think you're talking about right here. And there's just no way to soften that or to make that 
go away. It, it, it is, and it, 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 it really struck me that this was a reality in these guys' lives. It wasn't just kind of a conceptual kind of thing to toss around. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, you know, I, I believe that they had the same issues with the uh, ATIP program, you know, studying uh, UFOs. Like, you know, from accounts that have come out from that, it sounds exactly like what they went through with the remote viewing program in that when you're dealing with something that does not fall within the normal scientific and sort of religious paradigm, that a lot of people just cannot get their head wrapped around it. They don't want to rock their worldview as, as um, you know, Jessica Utz in, in our film says. And, and so they will do anything they can to stay inside this box that they have created for themselves. And, and if you think about it, you can go all the way back to Galileo and, and, you know, Galileo creating a telescope and going out in the streets and, and pointing this thing up at the sky and trying to get somebody to look through it. And, and by his account, no one would look through it remote viewing and, and psychic ability in general is that you can overlay pretty much whatever belief system you want on top of it. And, and no one can prove you wrong. I mean, I interviewed Ed May, you know, for, for the film and unfortunately he didn't, you know, make it into the film, but um, you know, he, he said, you know, you, we, we can study this for another 50 years and never know how this actually works they just know that it works well you know? ed may says that because that's how it's gonna and then that's how it's gonna come out i wasn't mm -hmm. impressed at all with ed may talk mm -hmm. about a dogmatic materialist he's there he, in my interview he's slamming parapsychology he's right. slamming dean raiden he's slamming uh joe mcmonicle mm -hmm. it, it's it's just the same old kind of turf war kind of bullshit that yeah it has all these limitations that we've come to expect with science. So that's, th those are the two storylines that, that emerge from the movie. One is kind of this crazy religious dogma that creates this crazy political process that where things have to be compartmentalized and, and couched in a certain way in order to get this minuscule amount of funding. But then at the other, on the other hand, there's this other force out there that is this skeptical, scientific uh, Ray Hyman who shows up in the film because late on, later on in the game, he looks at the whole program and says, yeah, none of this shows any, any scientific value or any operational value for the CIA. And that's why the program was killed. So you have to contrast that with the, the crazy Christians on one hand, and then you have the crazy atheists on the other and who's that's right. driving them what's their political agenda that's right and, and it's the it's the both it's 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 dogma on either side because it's it's a you know it's about someone who thinks they have it all figured out and and unfortunately or fortunately science should be about what you don't understand and and every advance in science throughout history has always been uh in the cracks that we have missed you know so, but but i, I want to mention about ray hyman even ray hyman who was the noted skeptic actually said there was something to the statistical data of remote viewing. He just didn't say that it was useful to intelligence gathering. That really gets back to the question that you were asking earlier, which is what has happened since the eighties when this was on Ted Koppel uh, and, and the seventies when this was really pursued to now. And I, and I do think that a certain amount of that is, uh, is guided. You know, I, I do think that this is a useful tool. And I think that um, if I was someone using this uh, in, a, in a large way, I certainly wouldn't want it to be known widely uh, how useful and how good it is. Because that, that would uh, mean that just about anybody can use it, you know, and, and uh, maybe as an intelligence tool, I might think that's dangerous. I don't know. Wow, I mean, you just touched on a bunch of topics that could become entire interviews in mm -hmm. and of themselves. One of the things I thought was interesting about the movie uh, on this level that I think, I hope people will appreciate once they get into it, is that this is a really a unique look at uh, secret programs and how they're run. Because mm -hmm. one of the questions I had for you, Lance, is the conspiratorial guy that I am, one of the first questions I had from the beginning is, 
why do you think they released all these documents? I have a hard time believing it's just for the vanity or the, the interest of this sweet old man, Professor Russell Targ, who says, <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to do this final tour. And oh, the, the CIA says, oh, great. Well, here's 60,000 documents that we never released before. Let's let the public know what really happened during the Stargate program. Well, what are your thoughts? Oh, I have all kinds of thoughts on that. Um, you know, we think of government as a monolithic thing. The government is coming after this, or the government is hiding this. Uh, government intentionally is very dysfunctional, you know, and, and intentionally is very compartmentalized, especially in the intelligence community. You know, if you don't want somebody to know about something, you, you just kind of sprinkle it around in, in, in different ways and you, and you do what's called stovepiping where, where there's, there's a very vertical amount of people that know about this and, and they don't talk to other groups of other people in the intelligence community. It's not like, you know, Department of Homeland Security where they're trying to track everything that's going on. It's exactly the opposite, you know, and, and so even within the Pentagon or even within CIA or NSA or, or anything else, uh, you know, they're, they're not talking to each other and, and they're not filing something in some centralized database where everybody can look at it. Um, and in fact, over time, a lot of things are probably really lost because the people that know the information get old, you know, they, they uh, you know, um, you, you lose stuff. And um, I really went into this thinking that there was this kind of monolithic force that, that had sort of protected this and and, and, and worked on this. And, and, and by the end, I realized, um, no, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And, and in fact, um, when we interviewed Ken Kress, who was the program manager that ran the, ran the remote viewing program for a CIA for the first uh, few years, um, he had never done an interview before. He didn't know what he could talk about and what he couldn't. And every question that we asked him and everything that he wanted to talk about, he had to send off to CIA to get approved. And, and when he told me that after like months of like back and forth with him and getting him, you know, to do the interview, my heart sank because I went, oh no, they're going to like nix everything. I'm not going to be able to talk about anything. You know, th this is going to be the end of it. And, and um, he uh, got back this response from them and he sent me, you know, all of the, the questions and the answers, you know, uh, before the interview. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh my God this is incredible. I mean, he's talking about like the CIA running remote viewers internally against Libya and like other countries and uh, you know, stuff that I didn't even know stuff that Russell didn't even know, you know, and, and they released all of this data, you know? And so you got to ask why is like, is this a plot? Like, are they trying? Well, to is know? it? What no. is your answer? No, it's not a plot. It's, 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 it's because the guy at the desk, at CIA knows nothing about this and thinks this is like a joke. I mean, he's looking at this and going, well, I don't know anything about this. Sure. You want to talk about it? Go ahead. Like, you know, like all that stuff's old news. You know, it's, it's, it's to a certain extent, there's a, um, there's a loss of, of continuity of, of how the information comes out. Now that's on the one hand. Now on the other hand, um, all of Russell's work originally was marked automatic. Do not downgrade you know, classified. Like normally when things are declassified, they automatically become public after 25 years. You can request them if you know about them. But th in this case, uh, Russell said when he tried to get some of his work declassified, he, he got back the stamp automatic, do not downgrade. You know, you cannot declassify this. So the only way to get it declassified was he had to go to politicians. He had to go to people within the defense department, uh, and, and basically start this like legal battle with his son where it went back and forth just to get basically the Pat Price stuff uh, and, and the Ingo Swan early stuff, uh, you know, declassified, uh, you know, uh, looking at Soviet weapon sites and, you know, stuff that was 20, 30 years old by that time. And um, see, but here's the part that kind of contradicts that. And it's right out of your movie. And it's the, the UFO link. Yeah. So, you know, fast forward now to where we're at now. And lo and behold, who's up on stage? Tom oh, DeLong. Wow. <laughs> and who's right behind him? Hal. Mm -hmm. Where's Hal? Lifetime player. Another thing your movie reveals is Hal was uh, Naval Intelligence Agency from the beginning. And when 
Hal Putoff and Russell Targ have a little bit of a split. I don't want to exaggerate that. It does seem like there are these two different guys. There's the researcher, Russell Targ, who's the mad scientist. And there's this other guy who's also a researcher, but at the end of the day is a lifetime player in the intelligence agency and knows how to work inside those circles. So if this was part of the agenda, that is to roll out the, the UFO fake PSYOP disclosure that be, they came in 2017. Not that it wasn't fake, not that those things really didn't happen, but it seemed to be, it seems to me, to, to a lot of people, to be a very controlled kind of disclosure of an event that happened 10 years ago and they've been sitting on for all this time, and yet they rolled it out like, hey, this is happening now. It, it, are you sure that maybe what they released to you guys wasn't part of a larger project of let's kind of push this stuff out there, see where it goes. I love your comment earlier that you just sprinkle it around a little bit and kind of see where it goes. And then you deal with the pieces after, after it's out there. Well, number one, anytime you deal with the intelligence community or people who are lifelong, you know, uh, people with security clearances, it's always peeling away the layers of an onion. You, you never are going to know what they know because they're not going to tell you. You know, like the, even, even uh, when Ken Crest got all those questions released, he said there was a ton of other stuff that he wanted to talk about he wasn't allowed to talk about. And, and I've called him since and said, hey, can we talk about that? And he hasn't, you know, uh, ever received a, a uh, final response back on it. So it's, it's, it's not that, that um, I, I, I want to clarify my earlier statement because it's not that it's all just in disarray and nobody knows. There's people that know. Um, there's just, uh, you know, it depends on what you're really talking about because there's, there's other even more classified things that we still don't know. I mean, Hal, at the time I interviewed him, said that probably 70% of what they had done in the remote viewing program is still to this day classified and he couldn't talk about it. So th there's, there's definitely um, a lot of that. And, and now in getting to the question of, is this some sort of intentional disclosure? In terms of the remote viewing program, it was the opposite. Because what happened was that, that Russell basically got specific things that he had done officially declassified. Um, the Army guys that had been getting out of the Army and going and talking about this stuff uh, were reviled by the CIA, you know, is, is what, I, what I later learned. The CIA hated the fact that the army had a remote viewing program. Now, while they were saying that they hated it, they were still using it. I mean, they were the biggest customer of the army guys, but, but the head of the CIA would publicly go before committees of Congress and, and berate the fact that they even had a remote viewing program. They wanted it gone. And, and now, in my own opinion, and it's just an opinion as a, as a layperson, um, I believe the reason they wanted it gone was probably because the army is too leaky. You know, like the guys getting out of the army are not uh, career, like lifelong intelligence agents, you know, like rock solid will always be there. They'll get out of the army and retire and they want to make movies. They want to, uh, you know, go uh, write a book. You know, they want to teach remote viewing. You know, they, there's a whole other sort of mode uh, of somebody who's an army grunt who just learned how to do remote viewing versus a lifelong uh, intelligence agent for CIA. And well, um, that's, that's one possible explanation, but let me throw out another explanation. And again, sure. this is something you touched on earlier is one of the things that your movie reveals is again, the long time problems and challenges that uh, a secret program like this faces. And we're talking about Joe McConnell standing up and saying, we survived five administrations. And that gets to this continuity of government kind of thing, right. which is necessary, right? You can't have a country's intelligence agencies spinning on a dime just because a new president is elected. Mm -hmm. That would be disastrous too. So these old timers who've been around for a long time, they see the value in kind of keeping it close to the vest and not maybe sharing the stuff with people the way the constitution says it should. So mm -hmm. it, your film kind of shows how that plays out, how these CIA, even the CIA directors mm -hmm. are saying rather kind of, 
absurd things in light of what's really going on in terms of the lo larger picture that you're telling. So isn't, isn't that just a, another point of confusion? Well, um, number one, you know, the, the presidents and elected officials are always the last to know. And, and in Russell Target and Hal Putoff, you had... Uh, would you say the CIA director often falls in that category too? Because I would. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, possibly. You know, I, I would say the CIA director probably knows more than the president does. Um, but but uh, Russell and Hal, the two scientists that started this, this program in the 70s, were, were both already um, vetted people working within established intelligence circles. They were both uh, the pioneers of lasers. Uh, and things like that. So they were they were uh, both really very um, respected people within the intelligence community already, and and they were respected within the intelligence community that had an official uh, oversight. You know, like they were reporting to you know Congress uh, committees and you know uh, people high up in government. So there was an official channel already to work through that was overseen by elected officials. So when they took their remote viewing experiments to uh, people in government. Um, th there was an official channel, you know, to go through. And um, let me just clarify, you're saying as opposed to, as we do understand it now, some programs that are just black and yeah. they're just black yeah, from the not, beginning. These were not black programs. These were, these were secret programs, but they had oversight. And, and uh, if you think about something like remote viewing, how easy is it to do remote viewing? Basically you close your eyes, you imagine where your uh, target is, is, is hiding, and then you write down what comes to your mind, the first unexpected images that you get, and that's it. You know, so so the, it, it doesn't take billions of dollars, it doesn't take fighter jets, um, but the government is uniquely placed to be able to find out if you're right or wrong. You know, like I can talk about what's going on in Russia, but I have no idea if I'm right or wrong. They do, you know, so, so you can infiltrate the regular uh, intelligence agencies by giving them information and, and not telling them where it comes from. Say that again. Let's talk about that. Well, okay. So, so let's say um, me right now in this room, I have a team of five remote viewers and, and uh, uh, there's one contact from government that has reached out to us. And I, and I, am, I look at a, a bunch of locations he wants me to look at. I send him that data. No idea if it's right or wrong. I may never know if it's right or wrong, but he knows and he may be the only one that knows where that information, he, where he's getting it, but then he's feeding it into the mainstream apparatus of intelligence. And, and uh, so even the intelligence agencies themselves may not know who this guy's contact is, but they're going to still use the information if it turns out to be useful. And if it turns out to be useful once, then the chances are it's going to be useful again and again and again. And nobody has to know how that information is being uh, uh, gathered. You know, it, it's not, there's no oversight. There doesn't have to be. And moreover, if I'm into the game of misinformation, disinformation, even within my agency, which is often the case, you know, mm -hmm. we'll talk a little story about Kit Green, where he, he admits that, that, you know, there were constantly tests done against him to see where his information would go. So the, the, yeah. these guys are playing this disinformation, misinformation, and spread of information at a 3D chess level that we don't totally even get. Absolutely. So take what you're saying and extend it to that. Who knows, you know, what's going on? Absolutely. And I, and I, am, I am constantly confused by, by people like, uh, you know, Kit and uh, people who are lifelong intelligence agencies. And you, you have to always look at it through the prism that they're not telling you everything. And that there may be an agenda, uh, you know, and, and you just, you have to, but, but you can still extrapolate out from that uh, because there's enough public information out there and enough people that aren't directly in the intelligence community uh, so, so that you can kind of get at like what's real and, and, and what's not. Um, Hold on though, can you? That's really the question because it, 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 Kit Green is a classic example of that. Mm -hmm. Lifetime player, your movie is uh, fantastic in the way that it captures Kit Green, not just the information that he gives in the, the film, which is terrific, but as you're alluding to, you get a sense for this kind of Wiley Fox, who kind of knows so much more than he'd ever reveal, and in a way is kind of playing with you. Like, if you poke at just the right questions, I might tell you more. 
But if you can't bring the level of discourse up to that level, then I'm going to divert you over this way. Do you want to talk about that any further? There's a, there's a distinct difference between somebody like Russell Targ and somebody like Hal uh, Putoff or Kit Green or, or some of these other people in that, in that Russell always was first and foremost a, a researcher who was looking to publish. You know, he wanted to publish papers. He wanted to uh, get the word out about like what he was finding because what he was finding was world changing. You know, the, the fact that, that uh, there is, uh, you know, proof of something like ESP, you know, like there is something that exists that we don't understand that allows a person to see outside of space and time and, and uh, gather information they otherwise shouldn't have. And so he became a lot more frustrated over the years because um, as this got better and better use, the amount of information going out got less and less and less, right? And now Hal and, and Kit both were much more company men. You know, like, like, like you said, Hal had a background with NSA and with, and with uh, intelligence. Kit claims that he still consults with CIA and, and uh, other intelligence agencies. So they're having an agenda that is not necessarily the best agenda to get good science out because it, it may not be their objective to get best science out. I don't know. I'm not in their, their click. It really isn't even a matter of science at the end of the day. And that's where I think you are. I want to explore that with you personally in terms of spirituality and your understanding of sure. spirituality, because ultimately that's what we're talking about here. When we talk about, uh, Russell Targ, and we understand that he wants to make the world a better world in some way that we're supposed to connect with consciousness and being psychic, which is okay, I can go there. But there is this natural tension with this other group that says, yeah, but you really don't want the Chinese sending an EMI weapon like they did off the coast of San Diego and wiping out your entire grid either. And that's a reality. And the Huns marching over the hills have always been a reality. And at the end of the day, this is, this is Kit Green. This is uh, Hal Putoff, if you will, saying, you care about your security more than you care about anything else. And you care about your security more than you think you care about this idea of spirituality and consciousness and loving everybody. So let me tell you right now, I'm going to go ahead and protect you because at the end of the day, that's what you want. So let's continue to e explore that because there is a reality to that that does transcend, quote unquote, science, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to start by saying that um, though I believe that, that uh, these guys who are lifelong intelligence agents are not able to say everything and may have an agenda, um, I, I've come to the conclusion that they, all, that, that they do care about the science and they do care about this uh, not being a, um, a dying mode of study. You know, meaning that this work continues on that they have done. And I'm talking specifically about Kit. I'm talking specifically about how put off. You know, um, people who may or may not still be doing intelligence work, they still care about the work that has been done. Um, my take on Kit Green, for instance, is, is, yeah, he cares about the science. He cares about what has been done. Um, he wants it to be talked about it. He doesn't want it to be talked about in a big way. <laughs> you know, he, you know he, he doesn't mind if the research continues, but let's not make it so big that, that uh, um, all of a sudden this becomes mainstream. So then, the, the, what do you think those guys are doing with the UFO disclosure thing? Well, what, that's 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 right where I was going to go. Uh, you, you know, the the uh, my take on both them with remote viewing and them with the UFO thing, and I am talking specifically about the people that I interviewed that were um, still sort of involved in these kinds of projects, even by their own admission, um, is that these are people who are in the in, on the inside, but they're not really on the inside. Let me just throw this out because I, I always right. dying to get someone's opinion on this who's truly thought about it and studied it as you mm -hmm. are. It seems to me that there's this straight up political thing that's going on that uh, too few people talk about. There's a left, right, Republican, Democrat, if you will, 
kind of flavor to some of this. And that, you know, so this, the UFO disclosure thing is clearly coming from the left. And I don't say that to prejudice it in any way. It just clearly, clearly is. It's Podesta and Clinton were originally the ones to, that wanted to bring it out and they weren't elected. So Tom DeLong, who was hooked into that, went ahead and brought it out anyway. And Peter Lavenda, who was part of that whole thing, which is lifetime spook. I don't know why anyone sees him other than just a lifetime. Wait, who, who is this? Who? Peter Lavenda. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Who, you know, along with Tom DeLong, it, you know, his story is I called up Tom DeLong and it's like, Tom, is it really you? Oh my gosh. Well, we have to figure this out. The only place we can go is the CIA. You know, it's like, right. it's just a, a kind of a manufactured story, but it seems to be coming from one side of the political spectrum. Again, not to prejudice it. And it's interesting kind of the crypto speak that the other side brings out through Trump, who is the current mouthpiece, like him or not for that side, who's saying, yeah, I'm very skeptical of that whole thing. So they're kind of taking that angle. And, and th there's this, we've all known for a long time and as your movie kind of again points out is there is this kind of straight up political way to understand intelligence organizations particularly the cia in terms of this right left and the agenda would seem to be for the ufo thing this kind of one world thing we need to you know it's global warming it's ufos it's one world give up your rights don't think about you being this individual kind of country in person. And then we have the other side saying, no, you should only think about America first, America is the greatest kind of thing. I, again, I'm not trying to flavor that in any way. I'm just saying in broad strokes, that seems to be one of the, the, the overlays on this. And I, I'd love to hear anything you think about that. Well, number one, um, Trump will be the last person they ever tell. <laughs> He'll be the last one on the boat, I think. But oh, but he has his own. He has his own people who are telling him. I mean, well, they're they're he's starting Space Force, and we don't know why, and all this kind of stuff. Yes, but but uh, you you got to look at. I, I think I don't know that it's left versus right as much as it is sort of logic versus superstition. And and again, you're talking about a a sort of very mainstream level of of oversight, uh, which probably doesn't exist because most or all of this work at this point is is no longer being done within the government you know like uh, you know th this clinton tried very hard in the uh, 90s with lawrence rockefeller uh, you know this is a, a topic that's covered in another documentary that i'm um producing and uh, editing right now called uh, the phenomenon with um james fox uh you know we we talk all about how in the 90s they tried to get access to uh you know ufo records from the us government and um you know, they were told that nothing was there. And in fact, in a very kind of uh, haphazard uh, cover up kind of a way. So it's, it's not that uh, they're being told something and it is being ignored. It's that they're not being told anything, which, which then brings me back to like people like TTSA. Uh, now I've thought a lot about like, what is their agenda? Like, what is their, what are they trying to get at with this, this whole disclosure thing? And you know, at first I thought, well, maybe there's some, you know, like working disclosure going on, or this is something from the top. And and now I actually do think, like, like getting back to what I was just saying earlier, this is more about uh, people who know something, who want to know more, who are trying to push the subject. That's what I think, you know, in terms of what they're doing now, because uh, they've been in the know, but there's probably other people somewhere that either were associated with government or are that know a lot more, you know, and most likely they're working in the private sector, you know, and they have some uh, classified contacts, but primarily they're working outside of government because that's the only way that you can prevent this kind of stuff from leaking out because eventually elected officials are probably going to leak it out. Like there's going to be loose lips, like something's going to happen. So they keep, this is so secretive that they keep all of this off the books completely. I think that's probably what happened with the remote viewing program. You know, you, you have it just off the books. It doesn't even exist anymore within government. You know, there, there's just so many layers to this, but it does get interesting. The, the thing about the UFO thing that I want to explore a little bit further with you is UFO is a placeholder. It's a placeholder in the public psyche that people can kind of wrap their arms around at this point. The real question is, non-human intelligence that's what we really care about mm -hmm. and that's et or 
whatever kind of spirit communication is connected with that and what that non-human intelligence might be doing with our government or might be doing with the population in general. That's where the stuff really gets interesting, I think. And it even gets interesting from an intelligence standpoint. You know, one of the things that really kind of turned my head around this is a UFO researcher named Grant Cameron, who's mm -hmm. probably done more, you know, Grant? Yeah, I love Grant Cameron, yeah. Probably done more work than anyone on revealing the presidential understanding of ufos throughout all these administrations going way back to nixon you know mm -hmm. and what he uncovered was the wilbert smith document the wilbert smith memo which was released under the freedom of information act in canada because he was the highest ranking official in canada who was basically responsible for everything radio and outer, outer space related so all the ufo stuff wound up on his desk and eventually he went to his bosses and said hey i need to go down there and see what the yanks down there in the united states know so he goes down and he comes back and he writes this memo that is later truly released under freedom of information which is like a rarity you know that isn't just leaked out he says ufos are the most secret, most important thing in the United States government. I met with Vandevar Bush, who we now know is like super connected, the right guy. And he mentions all these other guys who are the guys that you would want to know. He says it's more secret than the hydrogen bomb. And then he reveals a tiny little tidbit that ties into your story of third eye spies and remote viewing and also ties into this larger story of non-human intelligence. He says that there is a mental phenomenon associated with this contact experience. Mm -hmm. And from there, we have a greater understanding for MK Ultra, which mm -hmm. maybe we'll have a chance to talk about sure. in a minute, which is all about mind control, all mm -hmm. about consciousness and what that could mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. including the, the weaponization of that. But I have to wonder that if this wasn't always one of the primary objectives of all this mental slash consciousness work is to try and understand what's going on with ET because contact with ET was made by the government a long time ago as revealed in the Wilbert Smith memo from the 50s mm -hmm. and is now kind of being forced out in the latest, you know, to the Stars Academy release in December of 2017. I know I've thrown a lot on the table there. But no, 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 it's good. And, and, I, and I think that uh, that's actually something I'd love to talk about is the, is the psychic connection between ufology and, um, and everything else that I've just been studying. And, uh, and, you know, I have a lifelong interest in ufology too. I love studying that stuff. But, um, but what was so interesting to me through making Third Eye Spies is that uh, the, the sort of the weirdness, the strangeness that happens, whether you're dealing with something like remote viewing or whether you're even dealing with, uh, you know, ufology and, and uh, you know, seeing UFOs. And it's something that actually really gets missed uh, very often, which is that the phenomenon is not just seeing a craft. It's not just seeing a being. It's not just uh, whatever it's it's uh there's a general strangeness and sort of um uptick in psychic ability uptick in um just bizarre occurrences pk like all of this like very strange phenomenon um that comes um along with that territory and and that gets overlooked a lot by researchers because it's too weird you know like um there, there's a uh, in the movie that i'm doing with james fox um you know we have a photo of a guy uh, from Australia that has, um, it's the first, it's a perfect image of a UFO that he shot with a Polaroid camera, you know, 50 years ago, you know, and uh, it's part of a case that's in the, in the film. And um, what's not in that film is that uh, this guy says, I don't want anything to do with this phenomenon. And it's not because of the prejudice or because people came after me or anything like that. It's because after I took this photo, all I did was take a photo all of this weird stuff started happening. You know, there was all of this PK stuff flying across the room. There was, he said, uh, he, he said that in the, in the middle of the night, he got a bang on his door and he opens the door and there's a, uh, a little person, like, a, like a, a dwarf, 
dressed in Edwardian outfit and he's and he's berating them and in, in, in berating the guy in some weird accent and he turns around and takes a few steps and then disappears right in front of his eyes. You know, it, it's like completely non-scientific, weird, crazy stuff, you know, and, and you hear this kind of stuff a lot from people who uh, experience these kinds of things. And it's never talked about because it's so weird and so crazy that it's just not dealt with. But what it suggests is that um, in general, we're dealing with almost like cracks in the fabric of reality, you know, and, and if we're going to accept that, then we have to accept our own role in reality, you know, and, and the fact that, that we're probably a lot more than what we give ourselves credit for. Or a lot less in this physical manifestation and a lot more in our entire spiritual being, which may be partially here and may be partially residing in some other realm that we don't understand. Well, that's, that's almost a given. That's almost a given because it, the only way that you can um, see what's happening on, um, you know, the rings of Jupiter, you know, like what, like Ingo Swan did, he predicted there was going to be ice rings around Jupiter when everybody thought that he was crazy and talking about Saturn. It was a few months before Pioneer, you know, the first probe got there. Uh, the only way you could know something like that, that no other human being on the planet actually knows uh, is, is if somehow that information is already in your head or you, you have access to all information. You know, this is like what, uh, what uh, Edgar Cayce would have called the Akashic record, right? You know, so the, the thing about that is that it suggests that our consciousness is non-local. It doesn't just exist within our brains, you know, and this isn't a woo-woo concept. It's not a, you know, a religious concept or a spiritual concept. It's just what's being borne out in, in, you know, experiments that have been done, you know, is that there's no way that this could have uh, been known unless it was non-local information that we are picking up from some other part of ourselves. that's not existing in here. You know, I had a chance to interview Kevin Day, who was the top gun operator of the naval fleet. Oh, right. Tic Tac right, right. sightings actually mm -hmm. happened. And he tells an exact account of what you're talking about in terms of these Valet Davis effects from Jacques mm -hmm. Valet and Davis uh -huh. wrote a paper on it, which mm -hmm. is, you know, when you say the Edwardian little person that shows up at the door, mm -hmm. that's Kevin's story is not that, but it's he's tracking these UFOs and he's tracking them for days, which is kind of an interesting part of the story because why would you be tracking these things for four or five days that are following you, flying at 28,000 feet, and you wouldn't report this to your superiors? Mm -hmm. Again, there's some level of mind control going on here that we don't totally understand. But put that side of the story away for a minute. He's tracking them. They finally send up Faber and these other fighter pilots to go check out the UFOs. At the same time, Kevin says he walks up on the deck and takes the glasses out and looks at the UFOs. And exactly to your point, at that moment, something shifts in him. And he comes home, he gets off the boat in San Diego and he does his stuff, but he winds up retiring from the Navy after 20 years and going through just all these strange synchronicities, extended consciousness kind of things. And he's really struggling too, in the same way that if you study near-death experiencers, they come back and it's not just all love and light. It's a lot of depression, struggling, reintegration in with this, what are these powers and abilities I now have? So it's, it's interesting that that happened to Kevin Day as part of the Tic Tac sighting, but it's also interesting that the guys we're talking about who are the operational guys, the guys who are rolling out this information and who are spinning it as Department of Defense has to protect us because these UFOs could be dangerous. And that's clearly the narrative that's come out from that round of disclosure. They know Kevin's story. They know about this terror in the extended reality that you're talking about. And they also know, as your film points out and concludes with, Edgar Mitchell, who says, hey, doesn't this really transcend these little warring factions that we have on this planet? And doesn't it suggest that we're all much more deeply connected and have a much deeper purpose? So 
there is that tension that is unresolved and is left unresolved at the end of Third Eye Spies in terms of these guys, they understand that there is more. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, they do. And, and, and I mean, I think that anybody that studies this stuff, there's, there's basically two types of people. There's, there's people who have looked at the data and then there's people who have not looked at the data. You know, because if you've actually looked at the hundred years or more of, of data in, in terms of psychic functioning, um, you're not going to question whether or not it's real or not. You know, you're going to question what the mechanism is. You're going to question, uh, you know, how it works, but you can't question whether or not it's real. You know, once you've been exposed to it, especially firsthand, you, you know, there, there is a there there. And, and it's up to science to figure out what that there is, you know, and how it works and, 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 and move into that. Um, and I think that when you're exposed to something that is outside of your paradigm, it, it, it's like it creates a crack in your own consciousness that, that allows more in. And um, that can be very crazy making. You know, it's like I don't recommend somebody take up remote viewing without some sort of a, a, a discipline and, and, you know, oversight. And, uh, you know, you, you don't just want to do something haphazardly uh, because it, you can't take away somebody's worldview without giving them another one. You know, that's, that's uh, in one of Joe McMonagle's books, actually, which I really love that statement because, um, you know, because you're, you're going to fill those gaps with a bunch of misinformation and uh, wrong stuff that, that, that's just crazy making, you know, and, and in reality, it's just part of who we are as human beings. But, you know, you, you said something really interesting, which is that Kevin Day for three days did not even report the, the radar sighting. I knew he had seen it for, for four days. I didn't know he didn't report it for, for three days. Um, but this is a very common occurrence. And it, it's not, I don't think it's some sort of like mind control from an ET. I think it's simply that when something is so far outside of your paradigm that, that you find ways to rationalize. And, and again and again and again, we have to be reminded of sort of the more mysterious and, and uh, unknown and magical parts of life. Hey, that's all good. I love all that. And that's right out of the positive vibe of the movie and Russell Targ thing, but it just ain't that simple. Okay. You know, a guy who's been on this show who I really respect, a guy named Ray Hernandez, who's done the first comprehensive survey of contact experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, uh, Rudy Shields from Harvard uh, collaborated on the work. It's real research, but Ray's personal story, and it's a story you'll hear repeated over and over by people who've had contact experience, is direct mind control by E.T. So Ray is walking down the stairs while, while witnessing his wife walking into an orb of light that later does this miraculous healing on their dog, which is a long story I won't get into here. But Ray remembers walking down the stairs and then having not a voice, but an understanding in his head, oh, this is a bunch of baloney go back upstairs and go to sleep. And he turns around and he goes back upstairs and he goes to sleep. Now that defies all logic, right? There's Mm -hmm. this tremendous commotion downstairs. There's this huge strobe of light. You're worried about, you know, all sorts of different things. You walk down the stairs and then, oh no, there's, you just hear that over and over again, which again, this is the tension between the, expanded consciousness is great and we're all going to be as one and that there is some technology to consciousness that other people and or beings and or advanced human intelligence have mastered in a way that we haven't. And even that is kind of hinted at in your movie, which again, Green, who is really far from a villain. So I don't want to keep spinning him as that as he says hey one of the things that bugged me is we didn't just try and find the the best freaking people at doing this Mm -hmm. and rather than say so russell's out there saying no this is a gift to to humanity and being psychic means that we're all connected and kit Kit green's like yada 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 i want to find the guy who's the best on the earth at doing this so that i can operationalize it protect and weaponize so neither one is mutually exclusive neither neither point of view is 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 mutually exclusive i mean um are there 
things that are out there that we don't understand. I mean, I don't claim to know everything, you know, and, and are there experiencers uh, of, of uh, extraterrestrial stuff that have had really, uh, you know, valid stories about stuff, just like what you're talking about. Absolutely. I don't discount anything because I don't know. Well, you they're know, in your movie, right? I mean, Joe, Joe says he experienced that and Ingrid right. Swan says they've experienced sure, that. Sure, 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 sure. So, the movie has to draw a point and it can't talk about everything. But mm -hmm. that stuff does send things in a whole other direction because they're viewing Mars a million years ago and mm -hmm. saying there's a war on Mars and there's these giant beings that are ETs and they're building all these structures and then you have people in in your movie who say if ingo said it it's true because ingo never made anything up and ingo said that and so sure. did joe so what do you do with that well there, first of all you know remote viewing is always looking at potentials um it's an imaginal skill you know and and a lot of times like for instance in ingo's book penetration you know he talks about seeing stuff on the far side of the moon uh noticing a present no, a presence noticing him you know, and, and, uh, and then, and then looking there again and seeing nothing there, you know, so it's, 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 um, you, you know, like I said, reality is a lot more complicated than we give it credit for. And, and it's, but the bottom line question to all of this becomes very simply, uh, I think as Einstein said, um, do we live in a, in a universe where we're victims where where there is uh basically no hope for us or do we live in a universe that's basically rooting for us i'm paraphrasing but you know the, do we do we live in a, a potentially um expansive universe that we have some control over and um you know like i think that's really one of the fundamental questions of of humanity is like you know like what is our place in this universe like you know like and i think that if we're figuring it out now and um, there are other cultures out there, then they may have already figured it out. And, uh, and there may be cultures with different agendas. We don't know, you know, so, you know, who knows? Here's another fundamental question that we could kind of dig into as we move towards wrapping this thing up. If there is this extended consciousness realm, and if there are beings that have more power than we do, should we seek to marshal their forces? Because that is what's at play here. Should I do the magic thing? That's part of the shamanistic thing that you mentioned in Siberia, but it's also part of the ET contact thing. It's kind of, are, we, are there space brothers out there or are there kind of the evil alien reptilians out there? And do we want to somehow contact them and get them to help us in this world? Or are we, should we not even play that game and transcend? I think it's undeniable when we look at the fact that people are practicing ritualistic practices in order to marshal forces in this extended consciousness realm. That just can't be disputed. It also can't be disputed that the MK Ultra program was not unwilling to try and marshal those same forces. And it's also clear that in some cases that they've done, they've done that and that intelligence agencies around the world, including Britain and Aleister Crowley and Parsons on our side, have, have looked into that for the longest time as well. So what about that? What about using those forces for good or for evil? Well, it'll sound really philosophical, but I think that whatever you look for, you'll probably find. You know, I think that, I think that uh, the, the only issue with that is that, in a sense, if you're looking to do harm, you're really harming yourself. You know, and, and it's like when you really start to kind of like understand where all of this kind of leads you philosophically, I am inextricably linked to you. You know, everybody else is inextricably linked to me. So when I uh, start like, you know, trying to use my magical powers to harm someone, in effect, what I'm doing is I'm harming myself. And usually that'll just bounce right back at you, right? I mean, you know, it didn't work out too well for Hitler. You know, it didn't work out too well for... Uh, you know, everybody else that seems to have tried that. Now, now, can you use psychic ability to create some sort of a, a negative effect in someone or um, lead them the wrong way or, or, or whatever? Um, I think that, that a coherent mind is probably the most powerful thing on this planet. 
you know, and, and if you have a coherent mind, nothing can touch you. You know, it, it's, it's what you believe because all of this basically, you know, now comes down to belief systems and what do you believe is going to work? And, and if you choose to believe in really dark stuff, then, you know, okay, well, you, that's the world that you're living in, um, but I don't have to share it with you. Are all ETs like this benevolent thing that, that, that are uh, trying to help us? I don't know, you know, but it would seem to me, you know, that just like human beings have different agendas, you know, probably uh, somebody on some other planet would have maybe competing agendas as well. You know, again, we, just like we can't think of government as this one monolithic force, we can't think of um, this phenomenon that includes psychic ability and ETs and all of these other things as just one thing. You know, it, it's, it's maybe aspects of the same thing, aspects of consciousness in some way or form. But um, I think at the end of the day, this is all going to come down to how powerful do we realize that we are ourselves, you know, and, and that's really what this is about. I don't disagree with you. And I think that's actually uh, very deeply spiritual. I do think it's hard for people to process that inside of one, the country that we live in, we're both, we both live in the United States of America. We both deal with the contradictions that we are in terms of, we do put ourselves out there as being this beacon of liberty and truth and justice. And yet we look at our history, we particularly look at our history of some of the intelligence agencies, and we know that's not our history. And we know we've done the most horrible things. In our hemisphere, we've just tried to overthrow every government we could with, with coups. We've assassinated some of our own people. We've done Manchurian candidate stuff. We've brought cocaine in in mass doses and we're, we're at least turned a blind eye to the crack. I mean, you could go on and on and on. We're dealing with that. We're dealing with our complicity in being uh, who we are. So uh, again, uh, bravo. I mean, it's a fantastic film and it, it generates for anyone who's paying attention. The film brings those questions to the fore because you pepper it with all these little tidbits, Lance, like I was mentioning about the guy who gets on the elevator and says, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know from my most trusted sources that all this work is still going on. And you go, what? You yeah. know, that's something that's debated over and over again and on the internet and all these channels and stuff like that. So it, it's a great film and the dialogue could go on and has to go on, but at least this is a, a Kickstarter for it. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's, that's just it. It's like, you know, if you, if you can um, accept sort of the reality of the work that's been done, then, then it, it opens you up to at least consider what's possible, like what's possible, you know, personally and what's possible collectively and also what's possible in terms of what your government is doing or, or, um, and, or like I said, most likely it's not really the government anymore. It's most likely when, when, uh, you know, he said that and he said, he said, uh, you know, he'd be shocked if people weren't still doing it. They're not doing it in government. They're not doing it with any oversight. Anybody that has been publicly working with the government um, that's not still very much uh, in the middle of it um, is no longer involved. Like, I don't believe that, that uh, Joe McMonagall or any of these other guys uh, are, are still, you know, um, actively. Is that even a meaningful a distinction? As, as you just talked about yesterday, I mean, these guys are masters at, at, at all that stuff. So they set up some phony baloney CIA cutout organization that does it and then yes. passes the information back. I mean, that's not an important distinction. The, 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 the obvious point that I think comes through to you, why would you stop doing this? Right. Why would you ever stop doing this? You would never stop doing this. Right. It, it would be irresponsible to stop doing this because you can't trust that everyone else is stopping doing it, the Chinese. Well, this, this goes back to an earlier comment when we were talking about the, uh, the way that the thing is looked at, the way this sort of psychic ability is looked at today compared to the way it was looked at in the 80s. In the 80s, they didn't really have their act totally together in terms of like what they wanted to use this for yet. Now we're talking decades later, um, and it's a much more marginalized subject, and um, it's kept to the sort of fringes because I believe – um, that's convenient for people who are actually using it to, to yeah, sort of yeah. just say, yeah, we're not using this. And we fooled around with it. And it was like, there was really nothing to it. And, and in fact, 
you know, you'd, you'd probably find that most modern governments are probably in some way, shape or form using things like remote viewing and other kind of psychic techniques and probably trying all kinds of crazy things, like, you're, like you said, uh, just to see what, what sticks to the wall and what works, right. you know, because we know that there's something there and we don't understand it. And when we don't understand something, we want to understand it, you know, and, and so it, that's what it becomes about. And especially if it's useful, you know, and, and so we don't know how far down the rabbit hole this goes. And we can talk about that all day long. But for me, the much more important takeaway is what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? You know, like, what does it mean to human potential? You know, like, cause that's, that's really the only reason to, to talk about it. You know, it's like, it's, it, this stuff's been hidden since the days of the guy on top of the Mayan temple, you know, sacrificing victims or, or, you know, the guy on top of the Mayan pyramid who's sacrificing human beings and pulling their heart out is playing a different game than you and I want to play. He's not playing the be your greatest self, transcend all of this. And I think a lot of people struggle with why would I not play the game of getting what I want now in this life? Why I wouldn't play that? Why I would say the, what you said, the beautiful kind of spiritual non-dual, you know, to harm myself is to harm everyone. Mm. Why would I, you know, stab my left hand to get back at my right hand, you know, kind of thing. We get that on one level, but on the other on the other hand, we do look back at that Mayan temple and we go, no, we get that this shit's been going on forever. Yeah, but, but we've also get that people have been doing stupid things forever. I mean, and, and it's like that, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, fear is a very, very effective tool. You know, like it's a very, very effective tactic of control, you know, and, and, and it's also, you're talking about superstition. And, and, and when someone's- well, look, What are we talking about in terms of superstition? I mean, so the Chinese roll into Tibet and they pull the Tibetan monks out of their, out of their monasteries and they force them to have sex in the street with women and they do all this other humiliating Abu Ghraib kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's because that's what they're saying. They're saying we're, we're fighting superstition. And mm -hmm. we're all looking at it go, no, that's not superstition. They are accessing and manipulating consciousness in the highest, most profound way. So mm -hmm. uh, be careful with what we call superstition. I don't think, uh, I don't think meditation and, uh, and consciousness manipulation is superstition. No, that's a good point. And, and it's not, it's not, what I mean is that you can, and I didn't finish my, my previous point. There are real effects that you can find through consciousness and those effects are not explainable. So what that leads to is a whole lot of ritual and a whole lot of other BS that gets involved in the way that probably has absolutely nothing to do with the effect, but that's what superstition is. I mean, superstition is, okay, I saw an effect that I don't understand, so now I'm gonna go uh, you know, get a lucky rabbit's foot and I'm gonna kill a cat and I'm gonna you know, go do all these other crazy things to try to make it happen again. And if you believe strongly enough that you want that to happen, maybe you'll make it happen again. But it's not because you went and got the lucky rabbit's foot or did any of these other weird things. You know, it's, it's just because you build that into your belief system. And, and, and what we're really talking about is the fact that uh, human imagination is a very powerful thing and it acts as an enabler. You know, and, and that's really what we're talking about. I, I get you. I get you. But that's maybe not all we're talking about. Mm -hmm. like, like I'm saying, and that's the intriguing thing about E.T. Because I could talk about spirits all day long and people are sure. just going to go, oh, yeah, superstition, blah, blah, blah. But it's not. We know it's not because we know when you have a near-death experience, you're encountering spirits. We know mediums are encountering spirits. And we can test mediums scientifically in the lab. And that's real. And we know we do experiments with DMT like uh, Rick Strassman did and they're encountering spirits and they're encountering e ET. So, but let's take spirits out of it because it throws everyone the wrong way. Let's right. say ET and I'll go back to my story. ET is manipulating consciousness. We have just too much evidence of that to look otherwise. And we also know that the government like in Wilbert Smith memo, they understood that they're playing in that realm. All communication with ET is telepathic. We don't know how to do that. And they know how to do that. So right. I don't think we can immediately say, all the superstitious stuff is superstitious stuff. What if it's both? What if it's our human nature 
to add this layer of crazy superstition stuff, but there's also this hungry ghost element to it, this extended consciousness manipulation element to it that we don't understand yet. Well, take, for example, um, the act of a remote viewer looking at a target many times. Um, or, or, for instance, um, a whole bunch of mass consciousness looking at something at the same time, like the global Super consciousness Bowl, project. Or, or uh, yeah, global consciousness project, heart math, all that stuff. Um, well, you know, when, when there's a lot of attention placed or a lot of belief placed on something, it gives it power. You know, so, so I, I literally could walk into an uh, ancient Egyptian temple. And, and if I'm with the right uh, psychic, maybe pick up on, on um, you know, some ancient deity that, that once inhabited that temple. Am I really picking up on that? Or, or am I picking up on the belief system of the consciousness that once highly believed that? You know, like, like that's, that's the thing. It's like, if, if I'm, if, um, like, like, okay, uh, I recently had a remote viewer call me and say, if you have any property on the East Coast, you need to get out because there's going to be a huge tsunami wave and it's coming to the East coast and it's right. going to be sometime in the September of 2018, you know, and, and, and I, I got really upset and I said, I said, this is bullshit because how many times have, have remote viewers made these kinds of predictions, other psychics, other prophets, other things made these do or die predictions. They never happen the way that you think it's going to happen because no matter how much belief. And, and by the way, she said, Oh, but no, there was like 12 remote viewers and they were all really well known and they all came up with the same thing. It's going to happen this time. Right. You know, yeah. and, and I, I said, well, first of all, you don't know if, if that is going to happen or if somebody had a bad dream that it was going to happen and then they contaminated your sample uh, and, and they put that into the remote viewing and now everybody's seeing the same thing. And, and even if you were seeing it, even if you take something like tarot cards and you look at tarot cards and, and you're, you're asking like, gee, is my, is my girlfriend going to cheat on me? And you put all these tarot cards out and, and, the, and the psychic says, yes, absolutely. You know, and then, and then you go home and you break up with your girlfriend or you cause her to cheat or, or for that matter, even just the act of you looking at those cards. Now you as the observer have a vote in that and as to which timeline you're going to land on. So, so, there's, so there's all of these different kind of aspects to consciousness and it's intangible it, it doesn't you know really apply like when you look at an et are you really seeing an et or are you seeing something within a holographic matrix that's pretending to be an et are you just talking about energy you know and we, and, and we have and we have you know evidence of that we have evidence of i hate the word trickster but it's the common yeah, term that everyone sure. uses mm -hmm. there's a deceptive aspect to that spiritual realm that we don't at all understand either Right. But, it, but it, it's like we, we can have an encounter with an extraterrestrial. There's tons and tons and tons of stuff in the record uh, of, of actual material things that have been found, actual material, uh, uh, you know, landing sites, photographs, uh, you know, scars. Like there's, there's all of this stuff that's real. But, but again, are, are we, we, we can't say definitively what it is because we don't know. Is it really extraterrestrial? We don't know because we don't know, you know, so, but we can, it's fun to talk about and, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, interesting. And I would probably posit to say that, that uh, if you're actually going to believe in this consensus reality we're in, that it's a huge universe and we would be pretty uh, dense to think that there's no other life in it. But, but, um, but I will say that, that even that is inextricably linked to our observation of it. You know, and, and uh, um, you know, I've, I've seen uh, UFO summoners who can sit there and do a meditation and then create like lights in the sky and stuff like that. Are they creating an actual ET encounter or are they doing something else? You know, we don't know. More and more weirdness. So, <laughs> folks, we've gotten way off of the trail, but maybe we haven't too much. If you haven't seen Third Eye Spies, watch it. If you saw it a while ago when it first came out, Watch it again after this interview and maybe after getting to know Lance a little bit more and the deeper spiritual journey that he's on that you can tell from this interview and see if you don't see those threads coming out in the movie more and more. Uh, Lance, you've been tremendously generous in sharing your time with us. Tell us what else is going on. It, it, we did talk a little bit about some projects that are just fascinating that you're working on. What, what can you tell us about what's coming up? Well, um, we're, we're definitely going to be uh, shopping a, a, a TV series soon. You know, like that'll be, uh, you know, one of the next things I'm working on. Um, and 
as I, as I mentioned, I'm producing and um, editing a documentary with James Fox uh, that he's been working on for about five years on the UFO phenomenon, which, which really is basically the silver bullet of um, the entire history of the phenomenon starting in you know, 1947 to the current day. And uh, that'll be coming out sometime in the spring, and it's actually getting a theatrical release. It's going to be one of the first um, UFO documentaries ever to get a theatrical release. So that'll be fun. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's your YouTube channel. I was going to play that excellent trailer you did, because, again, it's going to send people or reveal to people a whole different side of you that is interested in this kind of deep spirituality. Are you doing anything with that? And, and what are your interests along those lines? Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I've actually, I have just started to build up my YouTube channel again after several years. And, um, and then I had to go off to, uh, you know, produce this documentary um, with James. So I, I had to kind of stop. But um, uh, I definitely plan on building that. And I definitely plan on sort of making that a, a really interesting space to talk about human consciousness and to talk a lot about these different kinds of phenomenon um, that we see from remote viewing to um, the UFO subject to um, sort of spirituality to cutting edge science. You know, um, I have so many friends who, who are basically, you know, just really on the cutting edge of uh, science that I would love to sort of talk more about and, um, you know, get on there. So, so yeah, I definitely plan on building that. It's um, the, uh, the channel is called um, Waking Universe TV. Um, uh, or you can just search my name, Lance Mungia, M-U-N-G-I-A is my last name, and uh, you'll find the uh, YouTube channel. And I do plan on sort of becoming much more regular with like the videos that I post um, soon. I'm trying to just kind of getting settled, settled in here. <laughs> well, you, you just look like a working movie maker, yeah. which is awesome. <laughs> That's who you're supposed to be. Well, it's yeah. been just terrific having you on. And again, congratulations on this work. And certainly we'll be keeping an eye out for anything else that comes out of uh, Lance Mungia's little uh, lab there. Oh, one other thing I want to mention, there's a possibility that my first film, Six String Samurai, may be uh, coming back to theaters, believe it or not. You know, it's like over 20 years old and uh, has absolutely nothing to do with any of this topic matter that we're talking about, but, but is really kind of a fun, kind of a cult movie, uh, you know, visually interesting kung fu film. And um, there's been some discussion about them uh, re-releasing it. So, cool. uh, so that'll and be on, And that's on Amazon, you said right now? Is it on Yeah, Amazon? it's on Amazon Prime too. Um, and so is Third Eye Spies. You can get that on Amazon Prime. Uh, you can also find it just on regular old Amazon if you don't have Amazon Prime or, uh, you know, Vimeo, iTunes, uh, really anywhere uh, digitally worldwide, uh, Third Eye Spies is now available. And um, you can get DVDs or Blu-rays if you want them directly from uh, my website, which is thirdeyespies.com. Uh, you can go there and, um, you know, join us on Facebook also, Third Eye Spies. And uh, I really appreciate you giving me the time for the interview. It's been a fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm.